Yeah, thank you very much. And I'll take the mask off. Thanks to you. Um, <clears throat> just so you know, fully vaccinated, and I'm actually old enough to get the, um, the booster shot, which I just got. So I'm really quite confident that I'm okay. Uh, but as they say, you know, you people that even when you're fully vaccinated, you can potentially, you know, uh, pass it on to somebody, pass it right through. So I'll be careful. Um, good 10, 10 feet distance um, as I talk. But today, uh, I wanted to discuss briefly with you about the Korean independence movement. I've entitled this lecture, The Shrimp Fights Back, NAPCO Eagle and Korean Independence Movement, 1941 to 1945. Now, I think I should explain a little bit about why the, the analogy of shrimp versus whale. That analogy actually comes from Korean American sources, uh, in which they compare uh, the Korean Independence Movement, they compare themselves to um, to the shrimp. And they said that we were, we were like a shrimp among whales. Now, what do they mean by that? Well, uh, they were talking about the relative power differential between Koreans and the, the imagined uh, Korean nation that they had versus the more, for lack of a better term, real uh, nations that were already created, that is the Soviet Union, uh, China, Imperial Japan. Now, to give you sort of a, um, a context for this, let me just throw a few numbers out for you. Russia, for example, or the Soviet Union, back about 1940-ish, somewhere around there, had a population of 168.5 million people. 168.5 million, okay? And of course, their land square, uh, eight land um, mass, number one in the world, at 6.6 .6 million square miles. So this is a very, very big country. You could easily see why Koreans would look at Russia, who were over to their uh, east in Vladivostok, and that whole region, and thinking, hey, you know, they're pretty big and powerful, kind of like a whale. Well, China would be further a little bit to the south and to the west, and China had 3.6 uh, million square miles of land, with a population, of course, number one, at 267.6 million. There's another whale, okay? And then the third whale, uh, that, of course, the Koreans and Korean advanced from the face, was Imperial Japan. And J Imperial Japan, of course, had about, um, let me double check here, Let's see. Uh, they had 2.9 million square miles of land, but of course when you throw the ocean into it, it's over like 20 million square miles. Um, and then their population ran, um, I think it was right around 80 million, some of their amounts as I recall. So that's also a large population. And then when Imperial Japan started incorporating all of these people, uh, subjugated people, into their their system. They created a. They actually created a, a class system of citizenship, so that there was first class, second class, and third class. Can you guess who was uh, first class? Japanese. Japanese and Koreans. Okay. And I think Taiwan was somewhere in there too. Second class, the people who were really good at business, right? Chinese. The third class, the Chamorros in Saipan and so on and so forth. So some of these Pacific Islanders. So they had these sort of three classes, Itonitos, for example. And so what they did was they classified them, but Koreans were actually put in the first class. And we know from, from the more recent research work that's gone on, there were a lot of collaborators in Korea. And in fact, like some of them even joined 
the, uh, the Japanese military, the Imperial Japanese military, and one rose up to a very high rank, another one even did the kamikaze, uh, what Americans call kamikaze, uh, Japanese would say tokotai, it's the special attack group that would crash their planes in to American ships and try to blow them up. But one Korean did that with an American uh, bomber. He, he took his plane and he crashed right into it. Was awarded some medal for it, but you know. Uh, so there's, there's Korea. Now, what, what, how does Korea compare to all of these people? Well, Korea has probably a population, it's, only, it's estimated, we don't know for sure, but somewhere in the neighborhood of about 29 million. Not that big, right? And then, you have to add on to how many uh, square miles? Well, one million? A hundred thousand? Uh-uh. 8,553 square miles. Really small. So as you can see, that was the reason why they used this analogy. We're like a shrimp swimming among whales. And when you have that picture fixed in your mind, then it, what goes on with the Korean independence movement, I think, makes sense. Uh, you start to see things within, within context. And I'll move to the second slide. Let's see. It's a little bit different from my... Okay. There we go. Uh, so, they would ask themselves, well, Given this very complex situation, first of all, what do you go for? Do you go for full independence or partial independence, partial temporary independence? And that was an important question, because some of them said, well, look, why don't we go for the one full independence, said, let's go and push the Japanese out, and then we'll be completely free. And others said, no, let's just ask the Japanese to let us have self-rule. And so that was sort of a semi-full uh, independence. And then others just said, well, let's just kick the Japanese out, but then because there are all these other whales swimming around us, maybe we better go with partial independence or even something like mandated territory under the United Nations. And so that was one question that had to be, be uh, addressed. Could they go for, if they were liberated, could they push for full independence, or was it going to be something else? And if so, what was it going to be? And this was a big question in the Korean independence movement. And then the second issue, which is related to the first issue, is economic liberation. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, that is to say that if it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have a, a nation if you don't have people who are economically independent, right? I mean, that was one of the big issues that Thomas Jefferson said. He just said, look, we don't need to, we don't need to mimic the British. We don't want to be industrialized the British. We're going to face West. And when we face West and take over all that land, we'll be a, a nation of independent farmers. And when you have a nation of independent farmers, you're going to be free. Okay? And that was uh, Jefferson's idea. Alexander Hamilton said, no, 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 no. My vision is this. Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is on my right, or Philadelphia, and uh, Boston is on my left, because Hamilton was in, was in uh, New York, right? And what did he mean? And this is the way we should face the future for America. Well, what did he mean by that? He meant, turn your back on the West, face London. We're going to be like the British, we're going to be industrialized, see? And so, but in the Korean situation, oh, the only realistic option at the end of the war was going to be, you need to become a nation of basically a farming, and if you are, um, what are you going to do? Now, if you look uh, at some of these nations who tried to deal with this issue, Oops, I didn't put it in there. Okay, my apologies. Um, the, the issue that many people faced was, was if you're a nation of farmers, are you farmers that own your own land, or are you farmers 
to help prevent that. Now, in the United States, in the 1930s, when the economy just bottomed out, everything went, went bad, um, the, the highest um, farm tendency was, I think, close to 40%, and then it drops thereafter. So 60% of all the farmers in the United States pretty much were farm owners. They owned their own land, okay? But the other close to 40% did not. And of course, if you look in the South, that's where farm tenancy was the highest. Now, if you know anything about farming, anybody farm, by the way? Ah, oh, you know about that, right? Were, were you a farm owner or a tenant farm? My family were farm owners at Silver. <laughs> right, okay. So you go, hmm, you know, we don't have to worry about anything, right? You only worry about the market prices. But if you're a farm, a renter, you really have to worry about things. Because, you know, I mean, the, the owner might say, well, I want X percentage of your crops. Okay, but then what happens if a hailstorm comes in? Like, what else? You know, well, you still got to pay. Uh, and so these uh, farm renters, you know, they're really struggling. And in Asia in particular, it was bad. Because in uh, places like, like, uh, let me just give you a good example of that. Oops, geez, did I put it in here? Ah. Like in, um, in Japan, farm tenancy was like 45%. Okay? So in other words, about half, one out of every two farmer was renting. And in Japan, the conditions were so bad and the farmland so small that families had to send their sons abroad to go to work. I mean, that was an important reason why Japanese immigrated abroad, was to do that. And the, and the, the, the family that stayed behind was dependent upon the son living abroad to send money in. And if they didn't send money in, or if the son was, you know, a full round kind of guy, Right? Then what, what happens? The, the family, back on the family farm, has to take out a loan. And in some regions in Japan, the, uh, the level of farm uh, uh, loans that were taken out started going to the second generation, and then the third generation. It was bad, okay? So in Japan it was bad, and one half of the, uh, the population, the farm population, were renters. Well, in Korea, uh, it got to, I, I think it was something like 70%, 70 percent, 70 plus percent. It was really bad. And in China, it was something like 60, I, I forgot the figure, 60 some odd percent. And, and so, you know, you have all of these, this, what do you do? Well, if you recall, like in the 30s, uh, late 20s and 30s, Stalin in Russia said, I'm not tolerating this. So he collectivized all the farms, threw everybody out on these farms and just said, you don't own this land, the state does. And so they tried them. Didn't work too well, okay? The US never dealt with the uh, farm problem and instead went with grow the economy. And so that pulled, up, that pulled down the, the percentage of uh, tenant farmers. China, at least nationalist China, said, you know, there was Mao up there in, in Yan'an, in northern China, and he was saying, we got to have land reform. We're going to redistribute the land. But Chiang Kai-shek of nationalist China said, no, we're not. And we're not because I need those landlords to support me. So there was no land reform that, that took place under China, not until Mao uh, Zedong takes over. And so you have all of these failed examples on one hand, and then on the other hand, you have, uh, you can pull out examples of where when land reform is actually implemented, it works. And a good example of that, Taiwan. Taiwan implemented this stuff after the war, after 1949, when the Chinese nationalists came over, they learned their lesson and started implementing that and then the economy started to grow. 
And then now you have what I think today is a very vibrant uh, democracy. Uh, Japan did the same thing. In 1946, MacArthur, you know, he took one look and said, oh my God, the communists are becoming popular in Japan. What do we do? And then MacArthur goes, hmm, I know. I'll do what my dad always said. Land reform. I'm going to... I'm going to pass out all the land, grab all the land, redistribute it, and give it to all these, these poor farmers. And he worked out a system, and I won't get into this, but he worked out a system based on a study that was done on Japanese Americans in the camps. Okay? And then that study was written in, put in uh, uh, MacArthur's safe, and pulls it out and goes, hmm, great idea, I'm going to do this. And he implemented it, and in 46, he, he started with what in Japanese is called the, uh, the agricultural land reform. And when he did this, amazing transformation happened across the Japanese political landscape. What happened to these farmers? They took one look and they just said, do we need the communists? <laughs> and then they said, they just pushed them aside and they embraced the, the, the ruling party. And, you know, and so that was how Japanese democracy got uh, from the root, was through this land reform. So, naturally, the Koreans, or Korean Americans, were looking at all this. Of course, they didn't quite see the post-war thing, but they knew uh, land reform could work. But the question was, how are you going to do this? And Sigmund Rhee, of uh, the conservative side said, well, let's table the discussion. So he was very much like Chiang Kai-shek. Let's just sort of leave it aside for the moment. Why? Because Sigmund Rhee knew he needed the, the landlord's support. So he wouldn't go for that. But then there are other groups, like the Korean National Association, which is the middle of the road, and this group said, no, we've got to have some sort of land reform. Okay, we don't know exactly what it's going to be, but we've got to do something. 70 plus percent is outrageous. We can't do this, okay? You can't build a solid, stable economy unless you divide up the land a little bit more, okay? And then the radicals, like this guy Diamond Kim, um, he said, no, 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 no. What we have to do is we just got to take the land. Take it and then redistribute it. So he was very much like in, in the line of what uh, Mao Zedong and some of the Chinese Communist Party uh, solution was going to be. And so Diamond Kim, uh, eventually in 65, he gets deported. So and I don't, I can't find, I don't know where what happened to him thereafter. But Sigmund Rhee, of course, he becomes the, the first president of South Korea. And so the conservative approach uh, wins. But now, uh, the conservative approach was by no means the approach that was necessarily going to win when it came to what the American government was thinking. Okay? Lots of people read back into the past. They look at Sigmund Rhee becomes the president of South Korea. Oh, it was a conspiracy. The Americans planned it this way. After all, how did Sigmund Rhee get back into Korea? MacArthur flew him in on his personal plane, right? Conspiracy, the Americans have planned it all this way. Well, not quite. Because what happened, um, if you know anything about Asia and, and the American planning for it, originally when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president before he died in April 1944, Roosevelt was a Navy man. So his plan was to follow the Navy. Okay. And so the Navy was working much close, uh, more closely with the OSS. MacArthur, of course, was all Army, and uh, so was Harry Truman, who took over from, from uh, President Roosevelt. And that's why it shifted to the Army side. Okay? And so that, that's part of, part of the reason why I think got it. But to get back to, to this situation, the OSS had actually started planning about what to do with Korea. And of course, the very first person they brought in 
uh, was, a, was an individual by the name of S.M. Gale. S.M. Gale was an expert on China, fluent in the Chinese language. Um, he actually worked in the Salt Administration in China. Salt was like the, the currency of the time. And so he was very, very familiar with what goes on in China. Um, and he was very careful to, um, to clue the Chinese in on everything that he was thinking. And of course, that's exactly what got him into trouble. <laughs> okay? Because he told them what the OSS was thinking, and, and that he was in fact uh, positioned in Chongqing, in China, uh, to report everything back to the OSS. And of course, that didn't always go too well with uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek over there, because Chiang Kai-shek was very nervous about American, British, anybody's participation inside China. Well, why was that? Well, because what happened when uh, Chiang Kai-shek really went out of his way to support the Allied war effort, uh, it's a real myth that, that and you know, if you go to China, uh, you'll, you'll watch CCTV and you'll see all these, you know, the, the, the great uh, Chinese Communist soldiers that are all fighting the Japanese, you know. But in reality, it was, it was Chiang Kai-shek's forces that really fought the Japanese. And they fought, I would argue, they actually fought extremely well without how little they actually had. But the problem was, by 1941, Chiang Kai-shek, because he was so committed to the Allied war cause, he lost too many of his best troops and his best commanders. So there he is in 1941, and then the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and he goes, great, now the Americans are fully committed to, what, to, to my war. I've been fighting this war by myself. Now the Americans are going to jump in. And so Chiang Kai-shek thought he was going to get more help. But when it came down to the lend lease provisions and you know, supplies to the Allies, who got the most? Britain. Who got the second most? Russia. Who got the least most? Chiang Kai-shek. He got the least. And it took the longest to get there. And worst of all, and this is what you need to understand about Chiang Kai-shek. If you read all these books about Chiang Kai-shek, except for the very recent scholarly work, a lot of them would blame Chiang Kai-shek. Oh, and his, his generals were no good. Oh, they were, they were afraid to fight the Japanese. Oh, they didn't do this and that. That isn't quite true. Chiang Kai-shek felt betrayed by the Americans. You know why? Because the Americans decided, without telling him, to send an aircraft, the B-24 Liberators, I think it was, and they say, flew off the, the deck of the aircraft uh, carrier, and of course, you know, they got nowhere to land, right, once they bombed Tokyo. And so they bombed Tokyo, with minimal damage, I mean, what are you going to do, right? And where are you going to land those uh, B-24 Liberators? China. Well, what do you think the Japanese were going to do? going to execute all of the flyers where they caught, number one, and then number two, any Chinese who even look kindly towards those Americans. And so all these villagers got slaughtered as a result. Chiang Kai-shek, remember me, Americans are getting into trouble again. And then of course when he got Joe Stilwell in, in, in Burma, Myanmar, I got him. This guy's getting me into all kinds of trouble. And so uh, it was a very unhappy working relationship. But nevertheless, Chiang Kai-shek was committed to the Allied war costs. And of course, when you look at the Chinese military casualties, over not, fully 90% were his forces. Okay? So that should tell you something about how committed he was. Well, the OSS, um, under Bill Donovan, was committed to Chiang Kai-shek, okay? And 
So was the, the army, finally, when they got rid of Joe Stilwell. And if you read anything about Joseph Stilwell, he's the big hero in American uh, history. But when you go to Asia, Joe Stilwell's name is technically right there, okay? And instead, his replacement, Albert Wedemeyer, is held up in high regard. And for a good reason, because Albert Wedemeyer um, consulted with Chiang Kai-shek, worked with Chiang Kai-shek, didn't try to tell Chiang Kai-shek what to do, and unlike Joe Stilwell, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, Albert Wedemeyer spoke with respect to Chiang Kai-shek. He didn't call him that Peter Hen. But that's what the Joe Stilwell called him, uh, Chiang Kai-shek. And so the OSS was in this kind of organization. They tried to set things up. They set S and Gale. It didn't work out very well. So then their next step was to set up the real warfare. But here too, the Chinese were ambivalent. We can't let you just go running around shooting up things. Because the Japanese are going to retaliate, they're going to retaliate against Chinese civilians. And so that was the danger. So this man, Carl Eifler, was then sent to Burma. And that's the reason why the American guerrilla warfare and the tactics that were uh, developed with Detachment 101 really began in Burma. And so, uh, where they were very, very successful in getting the local northern hill tribes to fight against the Japanese. Um, they got involved in this sort of intra or inter ethnic uh, conflict that's still raging even today. So the guerrilla warfare was, was the way that, that was supposed to be executed, but of course was not able to be carried out. But remember this man, Carl Eiffel, uh, because he's going to appear as the leader of not the next. I should point out to you that Carl Eifler, the guy was built like a big, you know, uh, tight end football player, and was really built this way, was quite a charismatic leader, and uh, actually didn't have that much military experience. His experience was in customs. He was uh, used to checking on, on, you know, imports and all these other kinds of things, looking for illegal, illegally smuggled in goods, and things like that. And he, they figured, the OSS figured, uh, Donovan figured, because he knew all about smugglers, that he would be able to smuggle in uh, his own supplies. And so that was the reason why Eiffel was, was chosen. But uh, what happened was Eiffel went on a mission in uh, uh, along the coast in Burma, Myanmar, and he he was, uh, the waves were just too much, and he, while well, he was trying to steer some boats, he got pushed over and hit his head against some rocks. And that gave him a, a tremendous um, physical ailment thereafter. And so they pulled him off from that uh, assignment, but then they then put him as what I call the bait. As many of you probably know, have any of you seen that book, uh, or rather that movie, uh, uh, The Spy, Petra Was a Spy? The same book, I think. Isn't it? You know Bo Berg? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Well, there was a movie uh, about Bo Berg, a guy who, uh, very brilliant guy, I think he was Cincinnati Reds or something, he was one of these baseball players with the catcher, and uh, the OSS recruited him as a spy. And he went into uh, Italy with the idea to, of determining, do the Germans have the capability to build an atomic bomb? And if they do, his assignment was to assassinate uh, Heisenberg, the, the main uh, German atomic scientist. Well, he interviewed Heisenberg, came to the conclusion, they're not going to do it. So, but he was able to slip in to Italy, uh, largely because, or in part because Eiffler was the one who was uh, putting on these sort of show kinds of things with, with weapons and going all around uh, 
the periphery of the German uh, occupied territories. And, and so the German intelligence thought he was going to try to slip in and get uh, Eisenhower. And he actually had a plan. His plan was to slip into Berlin. He was going to slide into Berlin, kidnap Eisenberg, put him on, uh, get into Switzerland, and then from Switzerland, hop on a plane, and then over the Adriatic, I think it was the Adriatic, I forgot his purpose, he was going to, they were both going to parachute out, and then an American submarine was going to pick them up, bypass the British, and they don't talk British anything, and then take them back to New York City. And uh, that was part of his plan. But of course, it was, I argue that that really was a decoy plan. And the real one, Mo Berg, was out there to try to assassinate uh, Eisenhower. Uh, Eisenhower. So this was step two, the guerrilla warfare didn't quite work. Step three, then, Eagle and Nakko. Now, for some of you, maybe if you're familiar with uh, uh, Korean history, you'll probably read a lot about Eagle and very little about Nakko. Eagle was what I would argue the uh, the conservative group's uh, approach to what to do in Korea. Now, what was this group about? Well, this group they had, they had this plan. They were going to have five teams of of uh, Koreans who were going to slip into Korea and they were going to contact the Korean underground movement. And then with that, those connections, they would then pass the information out to, uh, via radio, to Xi'an, or this actually just outside of Xi'an. And what they were going to do was gather intelligence that way, in anticipation that perhaps American forces might do a landing in Korea to uh, tie down Japanese forces in Manchuria. And then the US uh, Operation Downfall would then strike in Kyushu and then later in, in the Kanto area. And so this was the, the plan that was, that was going in operation. So Eagle was going to move in. Now, who were these people? 45 uh, teams of, five teams of roughly nine at first. Well, the, uh, the leaders, one guy, of course, the, the head of it all was, was Captain Do Dogi Ha. Um, he later passed away in Arkansas. He was very, very intelligent. He actually was from a descendant of one of the royal family members. And his father was killed by the Japanese. He was married and had a kid, but he was going to go on this mission. That's a very risky mission. So he was named the leader. So they promoted uh, him right away. He had language skills, Korean, Japanese, uh, he even had French. So he had, he had language skills. And then back in Xi'an, they had a number of army lads, you know, women, auxiliary corps people, who were back here, Korean American, Chinese American, and Japanese American. And they were based back here, and they were going to be the first ones to receive these reports and transcribe it and then send it on. And so uh, the Eagle Group was then going to come in. Now, they were supposed to contact the Korean underground. How do you contact the Korean underground? Well, you can't just be any Joe Schmo. You have to be someone with social political connections, right? So who do you think they put on Eagle? Korean Americans with good political social connections. So they were high, high value people that they figured could really, really make ego work. Okay? Because they, the idea was get Rogi Han, Korean American, and then you would have his, his five uh, Korean American officers who would then run uh, the other nine, eight or nine or so. And then they'd start getting out of the world. Now, where were those other Koreans going to come from? Anybody think? Yes? Can you imagine? In, in uh, Korean Americans probably never been about 8,000 in the United States at the time. 
So where were you, where were you to get the, the foot soldiers? The guys that were going to out, you know, way through, get the beaches, get in the trenches, doing all that sort of stuff. They went and got Koreans who had defected. Okay? Now imagine, if you're a Korean, you, had, you were conscripted into the Japanese army, and then you're, at your first opportunity you got, you defected. Or you just uh, deserted, I should say. Deserted, the Chinese figured out who you were, and then uh, brought you to this group over here in Xi'an for training. And then this, this group of people then said, okay, we'd like to join this eager group. Now, why would you want to join the eager group? If you got captured, again, you're, you're dead certain you're going to be executed, okay? Because you were deserted, right? And if they knew who you were, they could get a hold, hold your uh, family hostage, right? Or even execute them. So you can imagine this group of people in ego, how did not all that eager to go in and fight? And that's exactly what they found. Um, Robert, I forgot his name, Robert Chen, a Chinese American from, from New York, PhD from Columbia in psychology. He went and he interviewed all of these guys. And he went, not motivated, don't like shooting weapons. <laughs> Space Korean, right? It's fluent and evil. <laughs> but what is he going to do? He's not, not going to be a real good soldier. And so I argue that actually ego was the decoy. Much like I think was the decoy for the Heisenberg uh, for Joe uh, Mo Burke. But the real group was the NAPCO group right there. And the NAPCO group, of course, was run by Carl Eifler. Eifler had within his group the what I would consider to be the more middle of the road and the leftist group. Because one of the leftists was a guy by the name of Diamond Kim. And Diamond Kim was absolutely hard and fast. You've got to have that with him. Um, and he was connected with the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so he had all these uh, communist connections. But he was committed to, um, to Korean independence. Absolutely. There are other people like Kong Song Ria, that I talked about in my book, who was actually one who worked for the Japanese consulate prior to World War II. And they got him. And in fact, Kunsi Rio was going to be uh, one of the places, the houses that they were going to stay in. And another person they got in this group in, in Napco, which uh, I think made a little bit of headlines in Korea, but not much, was the founder of the Yuhan Corporation. They don't know, know of Yuhan Corporation? Yuhan Corporation is like saying standard order. <laughs> okay, you're, 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 you're talking about depends on whatever, you're talking about like the top, the huge conglomerate, okay? Well, the, the owner, the founder of that, that conglomerate was in here. And his attitude was, we've got to do some sort of land reform. Now, why, why did a guy like him, who's filthy, rich, wealthy, all this money. Why was he doing this money? Because his wife was actually Chinese American. And she was a doctor, medical doctor. He was in business and, and he did, um, I, I'm sure you, you've seen them, like La Joy Foods. Have you seen those, those uh, uh, La Joy Foods? No, you haven't seen those? Yeah. You've seen them, right? Yeah. yeah. That was his, his stuff. Okay? He started this off in Michigan with his, his buddy Wally, you know. They got together and they said, we're going to figure out how to raise these beans and do it this way. And they made it, I think he sold it to Wally. But uh, that was his, his company, okay. Well, Yuhan, he, uh, his real name is uh, Ilhan Nim. He established that company, uh, his large company, by selling pharmaceuticals. And he actually benefited from the Japanese because with their permission, 
he got to move into Manchuria and establish some of his, his uh, pharmacies there. Okay? So he collaborated with Japanese to a certain extent, but that doesn't mean he liked them. He did not like them at all. And so when he, he gladly joined the NAPCO group, and he was hoping, I think he was hoping that if NAPCO was going to be the real group, but they wouldn't tell him. OSS refused to say, tell him anything. They said, just focus on your mission. Don't worry about anybody else. When he was on uh, Catalina Island, anybody in Catalina Island? Uh, LA Harbor? Nobody? Nobody's done it? Have you been there yet? Did you like it there? Eh, yeah. so small. <laughs> yeah, a little dry. Right? Yeah. But uh, Catalina Island, off of in Los Angeles, was where they trained. Today, it's like where all the rich people go, you know, because they cost you like 60 bucks just to get the boat off of their back, you know? Oh, incredibly expensive. But uh, that was where, where you uh, were new was. And so you was there, figuring that if this group succeeds, and they start to, to move from espionage into sabotage, where they're actually attacking uh, Japanese forces, then, then he will be in a position to say, I should have a say in the future of, of Korea. Because a lot of his offices were in the north and in Manchuria, uh, some in the south, but mostly in this region right in here. And his headquarters before the Japanese kicked him out was, I think, coming out. So he had this sort of stake in all of this. Well, what happens at Eagle never really got off from Xi'an. They were still there, arguing and fighting. Who's going to be president? Who's going to be vice president? Who's going to be secretary? <laughs> they were all fighting. Oh, you need to go. Oh, you can be the senator. Oh, you know, they were fighting so much that one of the uh, Korean deserters took one look at that and just went, I can't believe it, Shio. What are these people doing? And he, that one Korean deserter said, I think I'm going to go back to the Japanese army, get an aircraft, and bomb those suckers. <laughs> and he said, they're a bunch of fakes. And so uh, he, he, you know, he actually hated them that much. He's like, God, these people are disgusting. And so, um, so they were sat there. They never got over. But when the war ended, one of, a couple of them did. And they flew from Xi'an to Seoul. One way trip on a C 47 transport. And what happened was this the, as soon as the war ended, one of the orders were you have to find the American POWs. And when you find the American POWs, you better deliver food and medicine so they can survive, right? Because everybody knew that in places like in Hainan, which is down here, the Allied killed ducks were just dying like flies. You've got to get in there quick and, and stabilize the situation, get them food, get them, get them the medicine, make sure that they're going to survive after the war. And so, uh, so the, the, the ego group then became one of those POW rescue missions. So, don't be hop, hop on board. But the person in charge was a guy by the name of Cap uh, Colonel Willis Bird. And Willis Bird said, we're going to go rescue the prisoners. Wink, wink. <laughs> what are we going to do? Oh, we're going to take food supplies and medicine? Oh, of course we are. Wink, wink. What, what are you going to do? Who's going to ride on there, you know? Oh, I know. We're going to get all these reporters. Why do you want these reporters? Historic event. We're going to be the first ones to land in Korea. And so Willis Bird flew them all on a one-way mission because he had only enough gas to make it there. <laughs> okay? And of course, no guns. And no assurance that, that the Japanese would shoot them down. So he took a risk. But the risk of the reward, he thought, was going to be, he was going to get all this publicity. First American land in Korea, right? So he flies over there, lands there, 
He actually got the Japanese to live in the land. They gave him enough gas to go back, because he didn't bring any of supplies. Nothing to help these people, right? And so, but when he was there, what did he do? He partied with the Japanese. The more, the more, yeah! Pour the sake, pour the beer, pour all this other stuff. They're having a great party. We're all bards. You know, the war is over, right? And then when Lewis Bird got back, he got canned. <laughs> because you weren't supposed to fraternize with the enemy. And so he got really, really in, in big trouble. But Captain Rogi Han, because he was only quote unquote the translator, he got away. So that's what happened to Eagle. Eagle never really flew. But the second group, not go, actually had already uh, departed for Korea. And it was while they were in transit that they were recalled back. And so it was very, very close. And of course, my question was, would they really have been able to land on this, this area right in here and escape detection? Really? I don't know. That was a highly risky move. But then Carl Eichler was that kind of person. Now, what does all of this then mean? And what does all of this sort of story with what the OSS have to do with uh, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania to create an investment. Okay. I argue that Philadelphia and Pennsylvania in particular had a about as close a connection, or much closer than any other region in the United States in terms of the grain investment. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but Philip Jaisong. He was founder of the League of Friends of Korea. And what he did was he created all these organizations and said, now, we want you to pump up Korea. Korea as a friend. Uh, be a friend to Korea. Push for, for Korean independence. Get the American government to be aware of Korea and try to, to argue for Korea's, uh, on Korea's behalf. And Philip Chaisong was one of these guys. And where was he based? Right here in Philadelphia. In fact, he was married. His wife was the daughter of the U.S. Postmaster General. And the niece of former President James Buchanan. Okay? I mean, so you're talking about high, high status. And here was Philip Tyson. You can even see his uh, Independence Memorial. Nice, uh, I think it's just outside the city of Philadelphia. Um, but Bill Jaisan is very closely connected to, um, to, to Philadelphia and why? He loved this place. Because it always reminded him of what he was struggling for. Bill Jaisan drew his inspiration from here. Okay. Right, right, right over there. <laughs> I mean, that's where, where his inspiration came from. He was, um, he died in, I think, 19, oops, I wrote down the wrong year. Um, he died in 38. I saw a little thing wrong. Okay. Um, he died in 1938. He was uh, in prison and um, fell sick, and I think he released him and died shortly thereafter. But uh, Philip Jason was, again, one of the, the, the stars in the Korean independence movement. And he drew his inspiration right there. And that's the reason why uh, it's often said of him that he sowed the seeds of democracy in Korea. That's Philip J. Song. But here's another person I really wanted to talk about, which most people don't know. And he actually appear in my next book. So he doesn't appear in this book, but in my next book, I'm going to talk about him within the context of how many American politicians supported Korea. Okay. People don't realize this. Uh, in, in this day and age, especially among the academic missions, we always talk about uh, anti-Asianism. 
And, and, and Asian is a real, is a real thing. There's 9,000 uh, reported assaults against uh, Asian Americans since uh, uh, the, the lockdown from March of 2020 to June of 2021. There's been more incidents since then. I'm sure you've seen some of it on, on YouTube, you know, where it just like, you know, just grab the, the Chinese person from, from behind and just started bashing, physically assaulting. And so, it, you know, it's a serious problem in yeah, anti-Asians. Um, and so, I, and I talk about that in my next book, uh, The Roots of Others. But what I also have to point out to people, that as much as you, know, you, you can say, hey, yeah, America has all this problem with racism, this and that, you also have to remember that America also has this, what I consider to be a very good thing, with what it passes on to some of the Asian Americans, and or the, on their behalf, and Francis Walter is just one of a number of people that I'm still investigating today. And Pennsylvania, I have noticed Pennsylvania in particular has had politicians who have been at the forefront or behind the scenes pushing for green independence. And I haven't quite figured out why, whether it's because of this sort of inspiration that Philip Jaisal drew from, or whether it's something else, uh, where it comes from, I still don't quite know. But I use Francis Walter as an example. He's a Democrat, House of Representatives from the 20th District, and then it was like 20th, and then 15th, and I forgot which other districts he he was, was in. But Francis Walter fought in both wars, World War I and World War II. And in World War II, he came to really dislike the Japanese, so much so that he took a dead bone of one of the Japanese soldiers and said, I can't find which. Carved it, turned it into a uh, lever opener, and gave it to Franklin and the Roosevelt. <laughs> I mean, really? Oh my God, you know, why would you do something like that? You know, he's a Navy man. He saw what happened to Pearl Harbor and all this other sort of stuff. He wanted to make, I guess, a statement. But what happens to Francis Walton is very, very interesting. And this is where I want to close with this. In, Francis Walton was always uh, an advocate of not changing the immigration laws. I mean, he pointed out, he said, uh, even the Kennedy brothers pointed this out. They said, look, you know, the immigration laws all the way up to 1965 were terribly racist. You're, you're, you're favoring all the northern and, and western Europeans, and you're locking out everybody else. That's not good. It's also bad for when we have to fight the Cold War, because everybody points to this is racist. Francis Walter was adamant, he says, it's not racist. Um, and so he was very, very, in that sense, very conservative. And he was also one of the uh, the no that, that passed the 1952 Walter, the Karen Walter Act. And if you know anything about the McCarran Walter Act, they went after all the, the communists. Okay? You know, it was just like, wow, you even say something like, hey, I don't like this American government. Maybe you should fall down. Throw that guy out, or we're not going to let that person in. Okay? If you had a Communist Party uh, uh, membership, who would be in? I mean, can you imagine that? Like, if you don't think about, like, like for example, um, my, my wife's family, you know, they're in China and we have all these neighbors, you know, they, they all told them, you know, they get pressured to join the Communist Party. And it's not really necessarily for ideological reasons, it's for you know, other reasons. You know, you get a little more benefits, right? So can you imagine that in the Chinese, if you join the Communist Party just for, you know, economic benefits, promotions of this and that, and then you decide you're going to leave. You can't go to the United States. Why? Because Francis Walter and Pat McCarran, the, uh, the senator from Nevada, had decided we're not going to let communists in. Besides, the person who ran uh, immigration and passports was a woman by the name of Ruth Shipman. She hated communists. <laughs> she wasn't going to let you in. You know? uh, that was, proved to be a real big problem because 
the OSS had recruited uh, communists to do the uh, propaganda materials, right? Because who best would, could, could operate and do and produce propaganda materials? The communists, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're experts at this. And so, and plus you can rely on them not to be fascists. So, the, uh, the OSS got them in. Well, when some of them left the country to crank out that uh, uh, propaganda stuff, they said, okay, war's over, we're ready to come back in. Ruth Shipley goes, you're a communist, I'm not letting you in. <laughs> My family's there. Bye. You know, and so, were, that was this man. That was his law. But what scholars don't understand, this is what I'm going to explain in my, my next book, he put in a clause in there, in his law. And in that law, it said, Chinese, Japanese, anybody else can become naturalized citizens. Now think about that. Ever since 1922, any Asian, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, who wanted, who an immigrant, who wanted to become a naturalized citizen, could not. They were defined by the Supreme Court as aliens ineligible for citizenship. That changed in, in the 40s with China and then India because they were considered allies. But the Japanese and the Koreans were not, okay? And that stayed on the books until Francis Walter, Pat McCarran said, this is wrong, we're not going to do that. And so they changed it. And to, just to show you that this is not just some sort of flippant idea that Francis Walter did to try to get votes. I mean, how many Japanese votes are you going to get in Pennsylvania in 1952, right? You're not going to get many. Bill um, Bobby Tano, maybe, <laughs> the one guy in, in the whole of Philadelphia. But what he then did was he flew to Tokyo. And when he flew to Tokyo, I didn't go to Tokyo. And I saw a photograph of him. And there, with me, he's in the middle, like a typical Japanese photo, you know, safer person is going to be in the center. And there he is in this picture. And he's surrounded by these Japanese immigrants. There might have been a Korean immigrant too. I haven't been able to check on that. And he celebrated them being able to get their U.S. citizenship. And when asked, why did you do this? How, why did you change? He was very, very modest. He just said, it's just the right thing to do. So I hope you can draw some inspiration from folks like Walter, Bill Tassan, the Korean Independence Movement, and how really, really important Philadelphia and Pennsylvania was to this movement that got the world away, that bore fruit. And you can see in South Korea today that democracy that's there. Maybe not in the North yet, but uh, at least you have it in the South. And with that, I am. Thank you very much for being here. Any questions? Yes? Was there anything that approximated? Uh, yes, the OSS actually uh, sent out their teams to look for and scout uh, China, Taiwan, and I think even Korea, looking for Japanese state guns. Because there were a number of Japanese soldiers that refused to go back to Japan. They refused to repatriate. For good reason. Uh, if, if you know anything about how the Japanese military um, organized their units, they put their units in by regions. Okay? So imagine this. If you, you're growing up in, 
in, in a particular uh, neighborhood, right? And all the guys in that high school were put in one unit. Okay? And then all, all of them died except you. You go back to your hometown. What's going to happen to you? Here is it. Did you desert? Right? Did you fake an illness? Right? If you're like a pilot, did you fake an illness? Or, you don't know, get those kinds of questions. Well, in Japan, it's, it's even more severe than that. Because they'll come right up to you and to your parents and say, Why did my son have to die? And you're still alive. And that was one of the reasons why Japanese soldiers wouldn't strengthen. Because they're just like, go back to that? If I go back, my parents, my little brother or sister, they're all going to be subjected to this kind of thing. Do I go back to that? And then, the, the other thing that fuels so much of why Japanese soldiers wouldn't surrender was they were in such bad condition to begin with. Food supplies were gone. Um, and if you ever talk to Japanese war veterans, they'll, they'll whisper this to you. They'll say, I, mean, I had one, one student who told me, his father said, No such thing as a Japanese soldier that didn't engage in cannibalism. Okay? They were that desperate. So you can imagine, you're desperate. You have to eat one of your neighbors? You want to go back? And I've read accounts of, of this one, in fact, this one Japanese American, he wrote his, his account in Japanese and I read it. And um, he was talking about how he was in the Philippines and, you know, the Americans were coming in and he was sat there going, I just want to die. You know, you know what I mean? Japanese American, and I forgot where he was from, Pasadena or somewhere. And it was like uh, California. And he was just like, I just want to die. You know, I don't want to live anymore. And he wasn't going to shoot the Americans. <laughs> you know, they were the same citizenship. You know, he didn't want to do that. But that's what happened. And then, of course, the last reason would be the law. Because Japanese had a law, a sentence them, which said, you are not to surrender at this point. So, that's what happens. So, their state behind is that they're there. And the OSS was investigating them. And the OSS was also planting a few of their own in those, those places. Um, it's no surprise that Bill Donovan, the founder of the OSS, where do you think he went? Thailand. <laughs> He had his spies already out there collecting information. Any other questions? Anybody else? Feel free to ask us. Um, thanks. I, I have two questions. One of them is more, I guess, just historical about the, um, the Namco group that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Like, what were they actually doing in Korea? Because were you saying they got called back at a certain point? Or, like, what were, like, what were they actually doing in Korea before? They got to be called. Um, and then the second question is, I think, uh, I guess a more broad one, but I think especially with this last um, slide that you went on in terms of Philadelphia, the spirit of American mm -hmm. independence, all of that, I think especially during the Cold War moment, I think you had people like, I guess, um, this, this congressman and Walter. Mm -hmm. um, but then also on the other hand, you had people on the other end of the Cold War in America, people like Paul Robeson, W.B. Mm -hmm. Du Bois, who were, you know, accused of at the receiving end of right. the McCarthyism. Well. And their concept of what it meant to be an American and to be a patriotic American was at opposite ends of what someone like Kim would represent. Mm -hmm. And also them, like I think, yeah, specifically Robeson Du Bois, um, when they were responding looking at Korea, they firmly stood on the side of um, believing that the U.S. should not militarily intervene and should not be basically committing essentially all these bombing campaigns, um, committing genocide, like what is essentially going to genocide in Korea. 
um, with the mapping of the population. So I guess how, how do you make sense of, like, at that in the Cold War, because everything was so fraught, so that's like, these different ideas of, like, actually what it, what it means to be an American and to be a patriotic American um, in relation to the Korean and stuff. Yeah, it, it really, let me go first to your first question about what, what were they doing prior to being recalled. They were trained. Because um, what you have to do, when you send in an insertion team, they have to know what, how they have to be able to slip in undetected, number one. And number two, they have to be able to communicate. You know? And that meant you had to, you had to communicate your messages very quickly in a short amount of time. Because if it takes too long, the uh, radio uh, detection finders are going to find you eventually. So you have to be very, very careful on that. Um, so they had to train. And so that was what they were doing all that time, as well as all the um, underwater demolition and everything. They were good at practicing everything you can imagine. Parachute jumping, all that. Okay? Number, number two, um, you're, you're absolutely right. Francis Walter can have that nasty side when it comes to communism. Okay. But what I'm really interested in, in doing is explaining why. Why was that? Uh, why did some of them feel that there was something wrong? Okay. Uh, or they thought it to be more wrong than other people. Okay. And it doesn't justify how Paul Robeson and many others, including Martin Luther King, how they were treated, right? I mean, to me, there's no justification for it. Okay. But what, and, and I, you'll see, I, I absolutely dislike Jacob Rubin. <laughs> oh, you know, the FBI knows this. You know, the FBI historians all know Paul oh, Hayashi's the only one who <laughs> never gives us a pass, you know? Like, yeah, that's right. But you know why? I got a personal reason for it. When I went to the FBI, I asked for records. What did the FBI do? They ignored me. Wrote them again. They ignored me. Wrote them again. They ignored me. Finally, I phoned them. I said, I'm in D.C. I'm coming down to your, your building right now. You better show me those records. Right? They opened the door. They let me in. The seat. They pulled out the records for me. So, oh, I need to go to the restroom. Sure. I'll escort you, the FBI agent. Escort you to the restroom. Female. And I'm gone. Okay. I'm about to close the door. And she says, the door opened. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> I know, that, that was how highly undignified in the training. And so I've never liked the FBI. Clearly don't like uh, Jagger Hooper. Um, but in fairness to the FBI and some of them, you have to understand the world of counterintelligence. And the FBI was absolutely horrible counterintelligence. They were a failure. Uh, Hoover should have been fired, you know, from my perspective. But when you're dealing in the, in the realm of counterintelligence, you do have to chase spies. And one of the things that we do know about Soviet Union, which you, know, um, you didn't see happen, and the CIA did some of the stuff, but not not very much and not very successful, at least in Japan. Um, the Soviet Union funded, basically, the Congress Party of the United States of America. That's just unbelievable, OK? Um, did the CIA fund the Japanese Communist Party, or, or did the Soviet Union? Well, they, they, uh, they did fund the Japanese Communist Party. But you know, did the US fund the Liberal Democratic Party in Japan? No. Okay. Uh, in fact, the Japan Communist Party got some of their funding from the CIA, <laughs> okay? Because they, they just kept, you know, under the table stuff, and it was basically Japanese Americans that were the conduit for that money to the Japan Communist Party, okay? Uh, so, so, you know, it wasn't like the CIA was quote unquote buying entire parties like the Soviet Union was, was doing. And so. Um, so you have to sort of see that in the context. Again, it doesn't justify bribery, from my perspective, any, 
for any reason. It doesn't, doesn't really exist. But that was the world, and that's how people perceive the way intelligence operates. I don't think it, it has to do that. Um, I feel there's way too much secrecy involved in all this stuff, and there should be far more transparency. Because most intelligence, most intelligence, is what we call strategic intelligence. That is to say, you're trying to assess what your potential enemies and your potential allies will do. Okay? I mean, that's really what it is. And with satellites and all that, you, can, you have a pretty good understanding of what they're capable of doing, which is called tactical intelligence. Okay? So you really don't, in my perspective, from my perspective, you really don't need all that sort of stuff. But um, back then, before satellites, before these kinds of things, there was a very close society as the Soviet Union was, uh, and China was becoming, you know, maybe, and North Korea definitely was, but very good, uh, maybe you do need those, those things to a certain extent. But it doesn't justify the way Paul Robinson, uh, Martin Luther King, I would even argue the Black Panther, the ways that they were treated, just abysmal. Um, and I often thought the FBI and some of those folks really need to learn their lesson from uh, Jai Son and the inspiration that he grabbed from that. So, does that answer your question? Is there anything else? Okay. Any, any other questions? Yes? Well, I have some um, small historical clarification questions. Um, I think in the description of the event, I read that the OSS, it was a pre the precursor to Korean intelligence. Is that correct? Or? What was what? Oh. I heard the OSS was a precursor to Korean yes. intelligence, or no? Oh, uh, yes. Okay, but it was American created? Um, see, the, the OSS was actually the precursor to the CIA. Oh, okay. Um, many of the OSS members wound up in the CIA. So, um, so there, there's this lineage there. It's not one to one, but there clearly was this connection. I mean, the reason why OSS was terminated was because Harry Truman did not want that to happen. But then he realized that, you know, you've got to have a centralized intelligence agency. And so he created the CIA for himself and for himself. And so OSS was terminated in September, end of September, so there's a little bit of a disconnect, but there's also that connection. Now, what does it have to do with the Korean CIA? Um, this is where I would argue, but I didn't have enough evidence to base this, that the NAPCO group, the Korean representative in that group, Su Kyung Chung, was probably instrumental in setting up the case CIA. And I suspect he may have identified many people, some perhaps wrongly, as quote unquote communists. And so when North Korea invaded South Korea, many of the South Korean police gathered up suspected communists and executed them. As known as the Volvo Massacre. Mm -hmm. I would not be surprised if that individual was somehow connected with it. Mm -hmm. I just don't know. And the trail goes murky and it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I had the evidence, I would put it in the book. But I just didn't feel like, you know, that's, it's a pretty gruesome thing. I mean, the Volvo Massacre is a huge political problem in Korea today. You know, who was responsible? Why were all these thousands of people, some of them innocent? Well, I mean, all of them innocent, because they didn't have weapons. <laughs> and they were being executed. Uh, and so, yeah, that's a real problem uh, that I see. Yeah, actually, I have a second question. Um, mm -hmm. It was about the eagle and the Nako group. Like, I I guess I was curious or wondering how that changed with the Korean War 
and the involvement of America and North Korea. Because it also seems like China was allowing the Americans and I guess Koreans to land in China and it's also motivated by certain alliances being formed in World War II. But I guess I was curious how these alliances that were formed in, for equal amount have you changed or maybe didn't change with the Korean War and the Americans in the world. Yeah, well I think what happens by the time of the Korean War, uh, it's now the CIA. And the CIA, I think, took away from the Korean War the idea that they needed to pay more attention. They were not paying enough attention to the situation. And they sort of left the Koreans pretty much to duke it out themselves. Um, which is what the State Department, in fact, did with, with the whole Korean independence movement. They just took a sort of a hands-off approach, you know, let you guys fight it out. Um, but I think once that took place, the Korean War, I think that's when they started rethinking things. Um, and if my guess is correct, because I haven't gone that far into the, the records on that, my guess would be the CIA did not like some of the things that they saw. I suspect they didn't, they knew about the Volvo massacre but couldn't stop it and didn't pay enough attention to it. That they would later on say, well, we need to do something about this and not allow those things to happen. And then that's where they got into these like, strange ideas about, well, not only should we intervene, but let's even install the governments that we like, right? And they did that in Guatemala, and they did that with Iran, and then all of those from the, like, man, I'm the world's greatest. I can install anybody. They're puppets for me, right? <laughs> of course, it doesn't work out that way. He was successful in, in Guatemala and Iran for specific reasons, uh, and for very limited times at that. So, um, you know, it, it's, um, I think the CIA learned a little bit from it, from the Korean War. Exactly how much I didn't know. Um, but certainly they were, in the 50s, they were thinking, they were going to be much more interventionist. Um, that whole idea of special operations, because when Eichler was so successful with uh, Detachment 101, that became sort of one of the things that the CIA was going to latch on to and say, see, we can do the same thing too. We can topple governments and put people in the relock. And so that's where they gave it the new twist. Eichler never had that, that twist to it. But they took it and they said, all right, we're going to do it this way. And so, and the OSS took great pride in Eiffel's accomplishments. Because if you look at it, I mean, they slaughtered all these Japanese uh, soldiers. In. And the one place where Japanese soldiers were, were most demoralized was in Burma, So they were the most, uh, OSS was highly successful, I believe, in, in Burma. Um, and so they took great pride in that. William Donovan, in his OSS headquarters, he built this theater arena to show the pictures of the OSS operation. Because okay. I thought took all these pictures. Those pictures are stored in uh, uh, Stanford, the Hoover Institute, right now. Nobody's looked at them. <laughs> you know? I mean, they were all supposed to go into that theater. And Donald was going to show this to the congressmen and say, see, this is what we're doing. This is how successful we are. Well, Alan Dulles and, and some of those others in the CIA took that attitude and said, we're going we're to run with this. And of course, when they did, pure disaster, right? Bay of Pigs and then the Cuban Missile Crisis, where they almost blow up the entire world. I mean, this is how dangerous game you're playing when you're doing these special operations. And so, again, that's one of the things that I really dislike about intelligence agents. I think we should be involved in these kinds of things, you know? That's, that's not, it's not your business. But that's me. So, any other questions? Anybody else? Yeah. I'm so yes. Sure. This last point made about intelligence agents Thank you. 
Yeah. Okay, well, I would argue that the period from, from 1947, CIA is founded, up to about the, the mid 60s. That's the period of, of the CIA being very interventionist. And then once they get their, their hand caught in the cookie jar, and the Frank Church Commission slaps them and the FBI for their bad activities, and rightfully so, okay? Um, what, what happens then is the CIA and the, the FBI start to reform. But what people don't realize was that from that point forward, American intelligence goes far more towards what we call signal, signals intelligence. And signals intelligence means that you're catching all kinds of radio signals, and you're taking them, and you're analyzing them, and you're tracking your enemies, and trying to see what they're saying. Well, that's the NSA, the National Security Agency. They are by far the largest agency, intelligence agency in the United States today. Okay? And they have connections with Australia, uh, Canada, of course Britain, and uh, I can't remember where else, but they, they, they would call them, they call them the five eyes or six eyes or something like that, you know. And so because of the uh, the widespread usage of, of the internet and digital, what happened was there's such an explosion of information out there that the CIA, uh, or I'm not CIA, the NSA felt the need to collect that data, but they don't have the capability to do it. So they got these different countries, British Commonwealth countries and Japan now, uh, to set up their their gathering, and so they pull all that in. Um, I was one of the earliest ones to warn people in the 90s that your cell phone is no longer private conversation. And people used to look at me like, oh, you, you've been reading too many spy books. I said, no. <laughs> I said, how do you think, how do you think the, the American government caught Pablo Escobar? Escobar was dumb enough to, to use his cell phone to, to conduct all his, uh, you know, his drug operations and live, not realizing that in Fort Cuernavaca in New Mexico, they were picking up all of that intelligence they hadn't even known. I mean, that's what they were doing. And when, when the uh, cell phones started becoming more popular in the United States, the intelligence agencies tried to, to get the, the cell phone operators to uh, turn the data over to them. They wouldn't do it. So then the NSA started building uh, receiving dishes right next door to the ones that were, were legitimately doing this, okay? And then they somehow worked out an agreement and the NSA stopped doing that and they just simply got some of the data, okay? And that's where, uh, you know, uh, created all these problems that we see today. Um, so, I always tell people, you know, this is a little bit of a, don't treat the internet or anything electronic as, as private. Just figure out it's going to show up. I mean, I was in a um, meeting, town hall meeting online, Kent State University, where we talked about the problem of anti-Asian violence today. And we did that, I thought it was in April or May. I think no, it might be April. We did it like the end of April. And in August, it appeared on CCTV. Chinese, uh, so Chinese intelligence gathers all this stuff. They put it in. Yeah, so uh, it's, you know, it, it is a, a problem because once it goes on the internet, uh, once you put your files up in cloud, <laughs> it's not going to be quite so private, even though they think it is. So, it's unfortunate the world's beyond. Okay? If there are no further questions, then.
so a lot that you got to go to the epilogue to find out the answer. Does a lot with the Japanese American, Chinese American, and Korean Americans who worked for the OSS during World War II. Um, all their work with you know getting past the pirates and smuggling double agents, questions of loyalty. Um, so it's a fantastic book. I invite you to buy a copy back there and we'll have our Yasha to, to sign the copies. And I'm so glad you all came. Tomorrow night we have our first Friday open house based on our exhibit, which is downstairs. We'll have a panel uh, that will be talking about uh, the Tinley Temple, uh, uh, the Methodist Church in there, and Reverend Dr. Uh, Albert Tinley, who uh, wrote many uh, famous hymns and uh, the organ, as we short, as it relates to the, the uh, exhibit. So it should be a, a fun evening. We again, unfortunately, cannot have refreshments, which is always fun for First Fridays, but we'll get those back soon, we hope. So we hope to see you back soon.